So in this video I'd like to have a quick look at the Keithley 2231A power supply here. Um, this isn't going to be a proper review or anything. I'll just give you a quick tour of the instrument and then we'll have a look inside and see what makes it tick. So here is the power supply in all its frame filling glory. Um, spec wise it's a triple channel power supply. It's got two channels of 30 volts and 3 amps each and one channel of 5 volts and 3 amps. Um, that's one of the very nice things about this power supply because it's a very compact form factor but it's got three channels and the third channel is actually a proper channel so it's got all the voltage and current control that you have on the main channels it just has less voltage range. In terms of the user interface um, it's actually really nice you've got this very big power button here which just clicks very satisfyingly and you've got this VFD uh, keypad and a couple of extra buttons and it's actually really intuitive and easy to use so for example if you want to set the voltage you use those voltage or current set buttons here and you can select which channel 1, 2 and 3 these settings should apply to. So for example if you want to set the voltage on channel 1, 2, 3 volts I say VSET channel 1 and 3 enter and that's it. Um, similarly I could just go to channel 3 now and say channel 3, 3 volts, enter and that would do that as well. Same for the current limit, I just used the I set button. It did remember which channel I used last, so let's set it to 2 amps. And that's that. That's really easy and simple to use. You obviously can use the chalk dial here, so you can say move the cursor to the um, 100 milliamp position and use this dial to go up and down, and that works really well. Um, one slight downside is you've only got a single button to turn on the outputs on and off simultaneously. So push this and all the outputs turn on or all the outputs turn off. And that is most likely a concession to the compact form factor because, well, I don't see where you could fit three individual buttons, one for each channel. Similar downside, the binding posts are actually quite close together. So, I mean, there's no problem getting banana plugs in there but it is actually a problem getting leads or you know, wire ends into the into the pine binding posts here. So that's a bit of a downside, but again, you have a very compact unit. Um, other features, there's not a whole lot to it. One thing that it does do is um, you can, for example, enable or disable certain channels. So for example, if you only want to use channel one and two, you could enable channel three. To be honest, I'm not quite sure why you would want to do that because you just don't plug your thing in, but, you know, it's there. It obviously does tracking between the channels and it does combining channels, so you can get double the voltage or double the current if you combine the two channels here. Now, a slight disappointment here is that you actually still have to wire up the channels on the binding posts here. So all this does is it changes the user interface, so if I say channel 1 and 2 in series, um, it reduces the user interface to one channel which controls both simultaneously but it doesn't actually switch them together inside the the unit. Um, for example the PS303 QMD here does that so if you set that to parallel it actually parallels the channels up internally and you don't have to have link wires between the two but um, that's just an aside. Um, one quite nice feature, which I never used, but um, might be useful for some people. Um, where is this hiding? I think it's hiding in here. Um, you can actually set the output sequencing. So, for example, you can say channel 1 should turn immediately, and then channel 2 should turn on one second later, and channel 3 should turn on five seconds later, or something like that. Which could potentially be quite useful if you've got some circuit that needs you know proper rail sequencing or anything like that. I've never used that but you know I can see how people might find it useful but apart from that there isn't really a whole lot to it. I mean as I said the user interface is very intuitive and yeah there isn't really much more to it. Um, it's a power supply um, that's all there is to it. So what I would suggest is open it up and have a look what lives inside. Okay, so I've just taken the cover off the power supply and this is what's inside. Um, the first thing you'll obviously see is the very large transformer, which is also very heavy. Um, you've got the front panel board, which drives the VFD and all the buttons and everything. 
and of course you've got the main power board which has all the power regulation electronics on it. Um, everything is wired together um, using those cable looms and a ribbon cable so you know that's all reasonably well done and you've also got this plastic bar here which um, is the front power button which goes through to this very big clunking mains power switch on the back here. So just a note about the transformer here. Um, whilst it is very large and heavy, if you add up all the secondary powers you end up somewhere around I think just under 300 watts if I'm not mistaken. And you know it's not that large for what's supposed to be a 300 watt transformer. And well even discounting that if you look at say the PL303 QMD here um, which has about the same power per channel that has two transformers in it and each of those is about say you know two-thirds the size of this one so I'm really wondering um, y you know what the sort of design for the transformer involved um, how they chose this transformer and I'm well to be slightly bored if it is actually big enough to sustain full output power continuously I mean presumably it's fine and I mean you have this sort of forced air um, cooling here which may draw some air past the transformer but um, yeah I would be curious to see what happens when you run this thing at full power forever uh, about the transformer. Anyway um, we look at the main power board next and see what nice things we can find there. Okay so here we have the main board of the power supply taken out of the case and let's just have a quick look at what's on here. So the first thing you'll obviously notice is this massively large heatsink here with the fan on the back. And all the power semiconductors here and here are mounted to the heatsink and the fan just blows the air out to the back of the instrument. The fan itself does have a thermistor here which does control the fan speed. Um, one thing I would like to do later is actually probe the, the voltage that's coming to the fan to see if that's a PWM or a constant voltage because I might be building some circuit to go on here at some point later. You'll also notice that switching out the fans for different sizes is actually a big pain because you can't really access the screws that hold the fan on, especially this, this fan here because um, this connector here which goes to the front panel binding post is in the way so you can't get a screwdriver in there very easily at all. So changing the fan is a bit of a pain and you don't have much room here either for putting a bigger fan or you know, a deeper fan on. So that's not very service friendly but uh, well I suppose you aren't really supposed to change fans so that is fine. Um, over here on the left hand side we have the power supplies for all the individual channels. So you've got a lot of transformer tabs coming off here which then supplies power to each of these. Um, the layout is actually quite nice so you can see you've got one, two and three separate channels here. These two here are the two 30 volt channels and this one down here is the one 5 volt channel. And let's just zoom in a bit and have a closer look at one of the channels in detail. Okay so here we have one of the 30 volt channels. Um, the first thing you'll probably notice are those big relays which are for switching the secondary tabs of the transformer depending on your output voltage. And next to them you've got this big chip here, which unfortunately they rubbed off the markings, so we don't know which chip it is exactly, but I mean it's very likely that it must be some sort of microcontroller. And you've got those two optro isolators here, which um, as far as I can guess are for the data lines to and from the front panel for this microcontroller. And apart from that there isn't really much in terms of ICs, well advanced as he's on here. You've got a couple of op amps here and also on the back side. So all the channels are very identical there. Um, but one thing that I'm noticing is I'm not really seeing any DACs or ADCs or voltage reference or anything like that. So I'm really curious how they actually set the voltages and currents and read back the voltages and currents. Um, Obviously they could be using the internal references and ADCs and DACs of the microcontroller here. And well I was looking at that a bit and there are those two SOT235 chips here which are also marked U so they're 
some sort of idea, I presume. And my first thought was that, well, maybe they are, um, you know, I squared C or SPI, DAX or ADCs. But once you trace out the lines, you actually find that only one line of each of the chips is going to the microcontroller, so it can't be, um, you know, I squared C or SPI or anything like that. And even more curiously, on the analog side, well, the presumed analog side, um, you've got a line going to the op amps here, but that line goes to through a two-stage RC filter. So what I'm wondering is, are they using a PWM output here from the microcontroller and maybe switching a voltage regulator and then filtering that output signal to generate the voltage it controls the current and voltage limits, which would be really curious. I mean, um, I'm just wondering, I will probe that later once I've got everything back together again, but it would seem like a very strange arrangement to, you know, use a regulator and switch that at a PWM and then filter that. Um, I mean, surely you would find a good enough um, DAC in a microcontroller, or maybe not. Um, maybe that is how they make the DAC and they use the built-in ADC for reading back, but uh, well, it would seem like a very strange thing to do indeed. But anyway, let's put that aside for now and look at that later when we've got everything back together again. Now, while we're looking at this channel, um, you'll also notice this very large um, current shunt resistor here, which, um, well, is a massive piece of bent wire. Um, it certainly looks very, very you know, 1930s, so um, yeah, I, mean, I don't mind it, but it just looks very out of place in this power supply. Um, as I said, I really don't like that they rubbed off the markings on this chip and I also don't like it all that um, you can see here they did attempt to glue down those capacitors but they just didn't put a whole lot of um, hot glue on at all so uh, you know this amount especially on this cap doesn't do anything at all so um, you know they could have really done a bit more there. So you know overall I really don't mind the layout and the design of the board but um, I think it's really let down a bit by you know pathetic rubbing off markings of chips and not getting the hot glue on there properly and and those kind of things so yeah not too impressed also these are Leylon capacitors which again isn't exactly high quality brand but uh, well I suppose it's fine for a linear power supply now just a word of warning for those of you who like to control the instruments remotely um, this power supply does have a serial port here on the back, um, but if you look at the rear panel, it actually says here in the cutout, um, port for USB adapter only, and if you go to the Keithley website, they will happily sell you a optoisolated USB to UART adapter, and there's a good reason for that, so I did trace out the, the way the channels are isolated from each other, and so those two channels, the 30 volt channels, are completely isolated from everything else, but the 5 volt channel isn't isolated from the front panel's um, ground, so they share common ground. And the UART also shares the ground with the front panel, which in turn means that the UART ground and the negative output of the 5 volt um, power supply are the same potential. So if you're using the UART without an opto isolator and you're using the 5 volt channel, be aware that they have the same reference potential so you might short things out if you're not very careful here. So like I said earlier before I put everything back together I want to have a quick look at this well presumed PWM output that may or may not control the output voltage and current. Um, so for this I've got the power supply rigged up here. Um, the negative output of the 5 volt rail as I said before is um, reference ground for the signals in here, so I'm using that as my ground reference to actually earth in this this case because that way I can just use this um, scope probe without um, the ground lead. Now obviously having the ground run through the mains earth isn't exactly good from a signal integrity point of view but it's you know fine for this I presume. So what I'll do is I just put the camera on the scope and we can have a look while I probe around. Okay so unfortunately I don't have a great um, camera angle so You'll be looking at the scope here while I probe around on the board and I'll keep you 
posted on which points I'm probing and what I'm doing. So I'll put this probe on one of the um, well presumed digital channels coming from the microcontroller. I'm putting that on U39 in case you want to take notes. So this one here, the output is off and it's set to um, 5 volts I believe. So output is off and there's nothing which is you know, fine. Uh, let's turn the output on. Oh, I really wish I wasn't right about that. So the output is on, it's set to 5 volts, that's on, sorry, 2.3 volts, that's from channel 3, the 5 volt channel, and we're getting this square wave worth, well, just under 50% duty cycle. So let's see what happens when I change the voltage to, say, uh, channel 3, um, say 3 volts. Ah, I really, really don't want to see this. 4 volts. So, it does look like they are actually using the PWM from the microcontroller to set the voltage. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's look at the output then to see if that is indeed a regulator. So, what voltage did we have here? That was 1 to 3.3-ish volts, I presume. Right, output is... Well, it's also just over 3. Uh, I'm wondering what it actually is. Maybe it's a buffer or something. I suppose that would make sense, wouldn't it? So maybe it's not a regulator that they're enabling and disabling, but a buffer. Which... Um, well, to be honest, it's even worse, because what it means is that there's no proper reference voltage at all. I mean, the top point of the you know, PWM depends on the power rail of the, um, of the microcontroller, and that's just as good as uh, whatever regulator they're using, um, which I can actually tell you instantly. Um, well, it could if the light was right. It's a good old-fashioned 1117, so... Yeah, hmm, not too impressed to be honest. Um, let's have a look at the other one, which should be the current limit. Uh, get the probe on there. Again, we've got 50% and the current limit is set to 1.5 amps, which is half, so... Yep, 1 amp. Great, 3 amps. Great, um, yeah. So, presumably, they are using the built-in ADC through back voltage and current. But, um, yeah, they're using PWM to set the output, which, hmm, well, that's certainly not what I expected. Um, I mean, if you look at, say, the PL303 QMD down here, that has a, I think it's 14 or 16-bit DAC, um, and, I mean, you compare this to a PWM in here that just runs off the supply rail, it looks like. Um, yeah, that's, wow, I, I, to be honest, I am at a lot of loss of words about um, that. I mean, that's something you might expect on a, you know, um, throwaway device or a cheap consumer product, but certainly not a um, bench power supply, so, hmm, wow, interesting. So this slightly indecisive waveform here is the fan power supply. Um, I just stuck the probe to the um, positive terminal of the fan and as you can see in the scope that is actually a DC voltage which, well in this case just flickers up and down because the fan is just around the threshold where it is turning on. So there's actually some sort of filtering and you know, buffering going on and they're not just driving the fan with a PWM which is quite nice because it means you know, it's easy to build something to go on there if you want to. So, what did we learn about this power supply today? One of the big things that struck me and that really baffled me was that they really use the PWM from a microcontroller to control the voltage and current set points. Um, I would have expected something like that in a consumer device, in an application where accuracy maybe doesn't really matter that much. But I would have expected that in a benchtop power supply, and especially not in something that has the Keithley brand on it. Um, yeah, that's just really baffling. And 
Having seen that, I'm actually no longer sure, or I'm actually very curious how they achieve the stated um, accuracy for voltage and current because you know, effectively you're relying on the 3.3 volt power supply and the buffer chips that are used. So how accurate that is, that's anyone's guess really. But aside from that, as I said before, there's some really nice aspects about this power supply. Um, for example, I really like the user interface, the VFD, the keypad. That's something I really love and I mean some people might not like this um, one on off button for all the channels at once but you know for me that is fine. And you also mustn't forget it's a very compact unit. Um, it fits on the bench nicely, it fits on the shelf nicely and I think it's quite unique in that form factor to find this kind of power on a linear power supply. But then again, on the other hand, maybe the transformer isn't actually up to scratch when it comes to delivering that power continuously, so I don't know. But the thing that's a bit of a letdown to me is just some of the engineering decisions, or what I can see of those decisions, that make me wonder whether this power supply is actually designed all that well. So, for example, the transformer, or the fact that you use the PWM to generate the set point, or you know, just the way that there mustn't have been any good quality control on that hot glue for the capacitors and those kind of things. So, yeah, I'm not too sure to be honest what to think about it. Um, it's got some good points, but it's got some pretty bad, bad points. So, yeah, not sure what to make of it, to be honest.